arteriosclerosis and atherosclerosis. What are they? We'll break it down. Arterio meaning artery, athro meaning soft paste or gunk, and sclerosis meaning the state of being hard or hardening. In summary, and taken literally, arteriosclerosis is having hard or hardening arteries, and atherosclerosis is the process of plaque buildup being hard or hardening. As an added note, atherogenesis is the process of plaque buildup, and an atheroma is a mass of ather or plaque. In practice, these terms are often used interchangeably, as these processes frequently go hand in hand, but they can also occur independent of each other as well, so we must ensure our language is used correctly. For the purpose of this video, ather, plaque, arterio, artery, sclerosis, hard or hardening depending on the context. If you want to learn more about the differentiation between the different sclerosises, sclerosi, sclerotica, I digress. Check this out. The state or process of this sclerotification is one of the main factors involved in ischemic heart disease, the leading cause of mortality in the world. Being as paramedics often deal with death, let us seek to understand the recipe nature uses in its most common weapon against us. What causes arteriosclerosis, atherosclerosis, and atherogenesis? These diseases start off with intimal, the first layer of cells in the inside of your arteries, to subintimal lesions, which are potentially the result of just the plain problems involved in transporting fluid through a tube, as evidenced by the patterns of their appearance around areas of fluid turbulence. A hot topic these days, the forces involved in oil and gas pipelines causes corrosion and cracks. Vessels are possibly no different. Another potential cause is changes in endothelial metabolism causing apoptosis, or endothelial expression of adhesive bits on their cell membrane, or cell metabolic changes that cause vessels to increase their tone, increasing blood pressure which, if the fluid dynamics damage theory is true, would only make matters worse. It's been suggested that certain bacterial or viral infectious sources can cause these diseases, but the literature I have is not completely confident in this. Inflammation. Why? Just look at the inflammatory process. I'll be doing a more in-depth video on this in the future for how inflammation attracts all sorts of harmful attention in this disease, but for now, check out Khan Academy's video on the inflammatory process. It has been suggested that it is more the body's inflammatory response to plaque buildup, not just the happenstance of plaque buildup alone that plays the biggest role in this disease's progression. There's also a chance phagocytosis of lipids into the subintimal layer plays a role, but very little is known about this from what my research shows. And interestingly enough, the arteries of the bronchioles are much less susceptible to the development of arterial sclerosis. As for why, it's unclear, but further study comparing and contrasting bronchial anatomy and physiology to coronary arteries could help shed more light onto the cause or causes of these diseases. However they truly get their start, these lesions result in cavities forming, which then get filled with debris called erythromata. What's the matter? Erythro is the matter. This process spreads to include the intima media. We then have intimal disintegration. Fibrosis, where you get a bunch of collagen and other extracellular matrix bits joining the party, forming a fibrous cap. Then hyalinization. Hyalin roughly translates to transparent or glass-like from Greek. It refers to the process of arterial sclerotic deposits taking on this quality. And finally, calcification. The process of calcium buildup in the ather and artery. This occurring in the intimal media marks the end stage of arterial sclerotic progression, unless there is an atherosclerotic rupture before calcification, which marks the potential end stage of something else. As an interesting side note, not all plaque formations are the same. Some develop thick and fibrous shells, while others are a flimsy one prone to rupture. And even when plaque formations do rupture, they don't always cause externally noticeable harm. What are the risk factors for these diseases? Renal disease. Why? If you can't manage the content of your blood in a healthy way, your blood contents can do unhealthy things to the vessel walls. Diabetes. Why? High levels of sugar in the blood increase the production of free radicals, which rip apart DNA. This causes cell death and opens up weakness in the cell walls for plaque to build up. Hypothyroidism. Why? Because when your thyroid doesn't work as well as it should, you don't metabolize as well as you should, leaving you at increased risk of obesity. All of that spare energy has to end up somewhere, and it ends up forming excessive adipose tissue and atheromas. High cholesterol. Why? Because the majority of the plaque in an arterial sclerotic lesion is made up of cholesterol. High cholesterol means a lot more of this raw material is readily available for lesions to grow from. At least that's the theory anyway. To date, no direct proof of this has been presented. There's indirect proof from people with high cholesterol being at risk for faster progression of arterial sclerosis, but not necessarily that high cholesterol causes it. Vitamin D issues. Why? Vitamin D is involved in the absorption of calcium. The Goldilocks porridge standard should be used for vitamin D. Not too high, not too low, but just right. If your calcium absorption isn't just right, 
Calcium doesn't seem to behave itself and ends up in atheromas. Although having super densely calcified atherosclerosis is better than having the flimsy non-calcified one. Super hardened atherosclerosis is less prone to rupture, although you're still going to have circulation issues due to the decreased lumen size, which leads to angina. Infection. Why? Infection causes inflammation. Inflammation is likely the most culpable biological process at work in the progression of this disease. Infection only adds insult to injury. Punishment to pathology. Difficulty to disease. How do we identify this disease process? Well, it's tough to identify this process in its early onset as there's often no recognizable signs or symptoms. Even current lab tests aren't sensitive enough to identify this disease in its early stages. Patients with these pathologies often have increased blood pressure. Why? Because the lumen, the inside space of a tubular structure, is now smaller. The viscosity, artery length, and flow are the same, but the radius has changed, and Poisier's law dictates that even a minor change in lumen radius will have explosive results to the variable pressure, although high blood pressure alone is not a very specific test for arterial sclerosis. The ankle brachial index. Take an ankle blood pressure, then take the higher of both brachial arm pressures, divide the two, and the result is the ankle brachial index. If this number is greater than 1.3, you have likely identified high vascular calcification. Pulse wave velocity is another method. There's a way you can take this using a smartphone, some software, commercial heart rate monitor, some transmission gel, a Doppler, and a tape measure. Not all common pieces of equipment for a paramedic to have laying around, but I might make a video in the future explaining how to do this. I will have to get permission from Edith Cohen University though. In the meantime, here's the link for your own personal research and study. CT scan is even better, but it's in the same availability boat. Equipping the ambulance environment with CT is expensive, and although community health, occupational health, and clinic paramedics might be able to refer patients to these services, the hazard of radiation exposure, costs, and return on investment is a barrier to its use. Using ultrasound, the measuring of the degree of diameter change in an artery during systole and diastole to figure out how stiff an artery is can also be used. But this again requires the equipment to do so, and is only a measure of the anatomy you can get access to, namely the peripheral vessels. Pulse pressure and augmentation index can also be used to identify the presence of arterial sclerosis, but it's not as accurate as we would like. But an increase found here may indicate arterial sclerosis due to the second systolic wave reflecting off stiffened arteries earlier than it should. As for other imaging methods, bones are made up of calcium, and in late stage arterial and atherosclerosis, so your blood vessels, with arteriosclerosis looking like long winding train tracks and atherosclerosis looking like patchy splotches. Biopsy can be used, easy to identify these pathologies when you lop off a part of the patient and look at it under a microscope. Bit on the invasive side though, and it doesn't give you a complete picture of the patient's vascular state. Only a piece of the pie. Literally. As an added piece of fun, the cold presser test. Submerge the patient in ice water and measure the blood pressure before and after. Got an increase in systolic by over 30 points? The patient probably has arterial sclerosis, although this is very clearly old school and I haven't read any recent literature praising its efficacy. How do we treat this disease? Well, we look at its causes. From a community health standpoint, ensuring a population has an adequate amount of omega-3 fatty acids and an appropriate dose of vitamin D in their diet helps decrease prevalence of arterial sclerosis. If fluid dynamics does indeed cause arterial sclerosis to develop, then managing fluid dynamics may help, so get that blood pressure, viscosity, and flow under control. ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, anticoagulants, and antiplatelets find their role here fluid dynamic medications. There are no current treatments for early stages of athero and arteriosclerosis. The methods used in the management of these pathologies involve more the management of the resulting secondary diseases like heart attacks and stroke, and the risk factors for the mortality due to these diseases. As we know, calcium plays a large role in both these disease processes, so playing around on the calcium chessboard may result in identified treatments in the future. For example, using medication that reduces the process of bone calcium breaking down and ending up in the bloodstream. Or using calcium mimicking chemicals that trick the parathyroid gland into calming down and stop causing so much real calcium activity. Any player in the calcium game is fair play. It's just a matter of doing the primary research to identify what moves are most beneficial. It's amazing to look back at how far we've come in the management of this disease process and resulting secondary diseases. From the 1940s, where a research paper I found remarked that it'd be a good idea to figure out how to identify the signs and symptoms of arteriosclerosis and the resulting transient ischemic attacks, and train doctors how to identify them. Now you think? Seems silly by today's standard, but if you think that was only about 70 to 80 years ago, just one single lifetime, and despite how far we've come, we still have very far to go, I wonder what tools and knowledge we will have in another 70 to 80 years. References in the description below, and as always, thanks very much for watching.